Do you think you're ready for what might be coming? Boy Scouts are taught to be prepared, aren't they? Now, I wasn't in the Boy Scouts. Lots of my friends were. I was in something called the Boys Brigade, and its motto was sure and steadfast, actually taken from Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. I think we can all agree that being prepared is a good idea, and to be sure and steadfast is also really important, particularly when it comes to facing the valuable things in life. Now, I say valuable, I could have said difficult or challenging, but I often think that those are in fact the same thing. But let me ask you a question. Are you prepared for the future? And when the future arrives, are you prepared to the point that you will remain sure and steadfast no matter what? Maybe the real question I should be asking is how prepared are you for the future? How can we be so prepared that we can face any eventuality, no matter what. Now to answer these questions, I'd like to turn your attention with me to this new chapter in the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. Today, we're beginning the first of a couple of days spent in Matthew chapter three. Now you'll notice straight away, this is the story of John the Baptist or the first appearance of him anyway. And you will recall, if you've been journeying with us last time, we reached the end of chapter 2. And at that point, we were still at the stage where Jesus was still a child. But now here we are, just a chapter break, and now Jesus is an adult. So between chapter 2 of Matthew and Matthew chapter 3, there's a large gap, a lot of years, somewhere around near 30 years in fact. However, there is something significant to look out for before we look at this passage. And that is, if you consider and think about the Old Testament that came before this New Testament, in the Old Testament, there were lots of people who were called prophets. But these prophets ceased to exist about 400 years before the events that are being described here occur. In other words... There hasn't been a prophet in Israel for 400 years and then all of a sudden here John the Baptist appears on the scene and he is said to be the one who is tasked with preparing the way of the Lord. Now we call him John the Baptist but some would say perhaps a more accurate name for him might be John the Forerunner or John the Preparer because he tells us that his sole purpose is to prepare people for the coming arrival of the Lord. Now, as I look at this passage, and as we look at this passage, well, it seems to me that it naturally falls into three parts. In the first part of this passage, we are told that John came preaching repentance. Then we are told that John practiced baptism. And in the later part of the passage, we are going to see that he proclaimed judgment. So I'd like us to begin by just looking at John and what he preached, what he said, in these opening verses, before it actually tells us about anything he says about what his preaching was about, it tells us a few things about his person. For example, verse 1 says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. And then he quotes Isaiah and says, A voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Now this opening phrase of verse 1, In those days, is a reference to the days when Christ is living in Nazareth, which is the way the previous chapter had ended. But what's significant in this verse is it says that John appears in the wilderness. Now we know from other passages of scriptures, namely from the Gospel of Luke, that John the Baptist was actually the son of a priest in Jerusalem. And as the son of a priest, he had the right to be a priest also. He was eligible to serve as a priest in the temple of Jerusalem, a high position that would have been desired by many. But he's not in Jerusalem here. We find him in the wilderness, which is way down by the Dead Sea region in the south, south of Jericho in fact. So what is John the Baptist, the son of a priest, doing preaching in the wilderness and not in Jerusalem? 
Well, the next verse explains that he is there as the one who was spoken about by the prophet Isaiah, as a voice crying in the wilderness, the one who cries, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now, according to Matthew here, Isaiah the prophet prophesied that someone such as this would come crying in the wilderness in this way just before the appearance of the Messiah. And the reference to Isaiah that Matthew quotes is a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 40 verse 3 which says a voice of one calling in the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord make straight the desert a highway for our Lord. So the analogy used here has to do with the image of making a road ready for the coming of a king. In the ancient world they obviously didn't have paved roads like we do today and sometimes roads would be improved for the imminent arrival of a king. So just before a king came to town, they sent out word and a messenger would travel into the land and tell people to prepare to make it straight and smooth because the king was going to be passing through their district. Many years ago, over 30 years ago in fact, my wife and I spent some time looking at the work of a missionary society in Nepal and travelling round Nepal, which was a very mountainous, hilly country, there were very many poorly maintained roads, many of which went along the sides of mountains with significant drops off on the opposite side of the mountain. Now what we became aware of is that there were constant landslides onto those roads, sometimes blocking them, sometimes large rocks, sometimes small. Now, when the king of Nepal travelled out in the roads at that time, the local villagers were told to try and improve the roads and they would try and clear the stones. Sometimes the stones were too big for people to move who didn't have cars or tractors or machinery. So instead of removing a large stone, sometimes they would just paint it white so it looked more attractive. And the locals used to joke about the fact that the king of Nepal probably thought that all the rocks in Nepal were white. But that's an aside. But the main point here is that there is a call to make a preparation to smooth the way. To, now there's an image being used here of taking out the bumps, taking out the stones and the rocks in the path that might trip one up in our personal life, to smooth over the holes, to make our lives a more fitting place in which we can allow the Messiah, the coming King, to pass through. Now, as you will recall, we'll see the subject of the Gospel of Matthew is the fact that Jesus Christ is in fact the King. And what we're being told here is that John the Baptist is the one in fulfilment of the prophecy that before the king comes, that there is one proclaiming, prepare the way for the king. Mix the road straight, like I said, make it smooth, prepare for the Messiah who is going to be the king. Now we're also told something else about John the Baptist in the next verse. We're told about the way he dressed. It tells us in verse 4, John's clothes were made of camel hair and he had a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Now that sounds a little strange. That makes him sound like a rather strange individual, doesn't it? So what's all that about? Well, actually the camel hair and the leather belts were just signs that he was operating as a prophet. Prophets in ancient Israel wore camel hair as a sign of mourning, but more specifically, the leather belt described here was a piece of clothing that we know from the Old Testament that Elijah the prophet was declared to have worn. Elijah wore a leather belt according to 1 Kings chapter 1, and we're told in Luke that John the Baptist comes in the spirit and the power of Elijah. It adds that little vignette of information to the same story that it's depicting here. Now one more thing about John's person, it says he ate locusts and wild honey. Does that sound very appetizing to you? Probably not, because for me, when you think of locusts, you think of an insect. Now it is possible that that's what it's referring to, but we don't know for sure. And the truth of the matter is that there was something else that was called locusts, and that was a plant. And Bible experts have actually debated for years which exactly this passage is referring to. And I have to say, I don't really believe there's a definitive answer. We don't know for sure. But what we do know, and what this text, 
the meaning that it's trying to put across is this is someone who was very different than the, the religious establishment around him. And that's kind of the point that this passage is trying to make. So this guy, he's out in the wilderness. He's dressed like a prophet. And remember, a prophet had not been seen in Israel for 400 years at this point. And he's eating a rather strange diet and behaving in a different way. And he is in the wilderness. And he is in the wilderness because that is how it was prophesied that this forerunner were and how he would appear. Now, people went out to him from Jerusalem and Judea and the whole region of the Jordan and they came to him confessing their sins and being baptized by him in the river Jordan and that tells us that in verses 5 and 6. So John the Baptist has come to prepare the people for the coming Lord, come to call people to make straight the road of their lives because the Lord the Messiah is about to come amongst them. Now, as I said before, the subject of the book of Matthew is the fact that Jesus is the coming king. So all of this aspect, all of this teaching, all of this perspective is in perfect harmony with Matthew's whole theme in that the Messiah is coming and that one day he will rule as king. And John is preparing the way for him to make his first appearance. But as I said at the beginning, these opening verses, though they tell us some things about the person of John, it's really focusing on his preaching, on what he says, on his desire to tell us how to prepare for the coming king. And the core of his message is contained within the phrase, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now this phrase is going to take a bit of an explanation. Because when most people hear the word repent, they immediately think of stopping sinning, a call to turn from your sins. Stop sinning is what we normally think. And that's something, of course, that I do recommend people do all the time, in fact, even in this podcast. But that's not exactly what the Greek word repent means. The Greek word repent means to change your mind. So therefore, John the Baptist here, his message is not about an external change of your actions. It's a call to an internal change of attitude. Now, of course, the fruit of that might be an external change of actions, but the core message is, is a call to a change of attitude, a change of mind, a change in the way you think about yourself and your relationship with God. Well, how do we know that? Well, let's just look at the rest of the passage and unpack it a bit. Picking up the text at verse 7, he says, But when he, that's John the Baptist, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God will raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So what's he trying to do here? What's he dealing with here? What's he trying to connect? He is telling them that these people, these religious leaders, they need to recognize that their problem is in fact in the way they think. And here's what they think. They think, I'm a descendant of Abraham, therefore I am one of the chosen people of God. You see, the attitude at that time was that they believed that, well, we're the descendants of Abraham, and that the Old Testament tells us that we're God's chosen people, and we're going to be in the Messianic kingdom, therefore, when the Messiah comes, and everybody else is going to be excluded. In other words, a great many of the Jewish people at the time that Christ was living and appearing amongst them believed that their religion, their religion and the following of their religion was the thing that got them into the kingdom that was coming, the coming kingdom of God. And that's very important. In a sense, the Jews of their days were trusting in their ancestry, which they traced and backed all the way through the family descendants back to Abraham, as their merit for gaining access into the kingdom of God. But then this guy, John the Baptist, comes along and says, Repent. And the word means, as I said, change your mind. So it's a call for a change of internal 
attitude and he wants them to change their minds. He wants them to quit trusting in themselves, to quit trusting that they have got some sort of merit because they happen to be descendants of Abraham and start looking to God himself for their righteousness. And that in itself is the thing that will bring about the internal change of attitude. So what he's calling for is an attitude change, not a change in the external acts of what they do. And look at verse 8. It tells us, he tells them that they need to bear fruit that is worthy of a life of repentance. Uh, so that verse clearly demonstrates that there's a difference between the road of repentance and the road of external acts of pride and religious religiosity. And it's a separate path to one that relies on your own ancestry, your family tree, or even your obedience to external acts of religious observance. So John then declares, picking up in verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, I whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquestionable fire. So my conclusion here is that repentance that has been called for is an internal change of heart, an internal change of attitude, an internal change of direction, which is why he uses the word repent, the decision to turn your life around, to turn and go in a different direction and reflect the internal change of attitude, the fruit of which will be different actions in your life. And John is unpacking this in his message. In other words, the core of it, you've got to change your mind about thinking you can trust in yourself. And instead of trusting yourself, to have merit before God, what you have to do is turn to God himself and trust him. So that raises the question, who are you going to trust if you can't trust in yourself anymore? Well, John the Baptist clearly tells them and by nature teaches us today, well, the whole Bible clearly teaches, he's saying there's one coming after me. At that point, he's saying there's someone coming after me. I'm not worthy to even carry his shoes and he's the one you're going to need to trust. Now, in Acts chapter 19, Luke, quoting Paul, says that John the Baptist preached that they should believe on the one who will come after him, namely Jesus Christ. So bound up in this idea of repentance is the idea that you should change your mind from trusting in yourself to trusting in Jesus Christ. In other words, it's kind of a transfer of trust. That's the idea of repentance. You're transferring your trust by believing that you can trust in your own merit in any way, either through your actions or your religious observances, and instead you trust in God's mercy. Jesus Christ will be seen to die to pay for sin. He will also be seen to rise from the dead. Jesus Christ changes, in fact, he becomes the transaction that is paid on our behalf for the atonement for sin. From that of trusting in something that we do or something that we say, or something that we have done. Instead, we trust in him. We trust that when he died, he paid price for our sin. And when he arose from the dead, we trust in him that we have not only have that forgiveness, but we have an inheritance in the kingdom of heaven on earth in this life, because that debt of our sin has been paid, but also in the kingdom of heaven to come. So what is this phrase, the kingdom of heaven? Where did that concept come from and what does it mean? So we come across this phrase, the kingdom of heaven, in the opening verses of this chapter. So what is the kingdom of heaven? Where does that concept come from? The exact phrase itself doesn't appear in any part of the Old Testament, but the idea of a kingdom definitely does. So let me just quickly pause and tell you what the Old Testament says about this idea. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, God promised David a son who would rule forever, it says. Now all the rabbis of Jesus' time understood that the son of David was the Messiah. Furthermore, Daniel, in chapter 2 of Daniel, he is seen to prophesy that the kingdom of heaven will be established, a kingdom that will come after he destroys all the kingdoms of this world. 
The rabbis of Jesus' time also understood that God is going to at some point destroy all these earthly kingdoms and set up a messianic kingdom and that's the backdrop for this free is the kingdom of heaven. Now scholars tell us that at the time of Jesus many in Israel were expecting this Messiah to come at any moment. And beyond that, there was an expectation throughout the ancient world that there was a some sort of Messiah was about to come. And here we see in Israel, John the Baptist appear and be the first person for over 400 years to stand up and say the kingdom of heaven is at hand, meaning God is about to establish a new kingdom. He doesn't actually say it's here now. He says it's at hand, which means it's near, but not quite here yet. Now, this is important, and it's important to understand this for several reasons. You see, theologians today differ over the nature of what this kingdom of God is. One camp says that the kingdom is purely of spiritual nature, and that when Jesus came and he rules in the hearts of individuals, that that means that the kingdom has arrived. Now, there's some truth to that thought, and we see aspects of that taught in the teachings of Jesus and in fact throughout the whole Bible. But then there's this other point of view. No, the kingdom didn't come when Jesus was here. It was only near when he was here. And it was only near because he was here. I personally believe the Bible makes it very clear that this is a kingdom that will arrive fully in the future. So what is it? Is this a kingdom that is spiritual and has arrived? It arrived the very moment Christ arrived? Or is the kingdom that's been talked about here something that is said to be coming later? And that later will be when Jesus comes back and establishes a literal kingdom on the earth. I think it's very evident from reading the scriptures that it is in fact the latter. Just listen to the Lord's Prayer. These are the words of Jesus himself, remember, while he walked the earth. Our Father who art in heaven, thy kingdom come. So Jesus himself is clearly saying it's not here yet. We want it to come. He wants it to come. In fact, he's praying and teaching us to pray that it comes. Remember also that we read passages about the Last Supper where Jesus was seen to say, I will not eat the fruit of the vine until I eat it again with you in the kingdom. But the passage that really clinches it for me is actually found in Acts chapter 1. Remember, Jesus has died and he's been resurrected and he then makes appearances to his disciples and his followers before he ascends. And just before he ascends, he meets with his disciples and the disciples say to him, are you going to establish the kingdom now? Now, this is important. These guys have just spent three years with him. If anybody would have understood that the kingdom was already here or whether it was even here or not, it is this group. They understood it wasn't here yet because they were still expecting it. And I have to say that's what the majority of commentators believe about this perspective. Of course, at this point, these disciples were probably expecting some literal kingdom, something that was going to replace the political institutions of the day. And Jesus, as good as says, don't you worry about that. I have another job for you. After I've gone, your job, well, first of all, you're going to receive power on the Holy Spirit because he's going to come upon you. But then you are to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and beyond. Go do that, and the kingdom will come later, he says. So my conclusion is the kingdom in the New Testament is that which comes uh, when Jesus comes again and sets up a kingdom. Okay, let's try and tie this whole passage of these first 11, 12 verses together. What I'm saying is that the kingdom is coming and because of that you need to be prepared. And John the Baptist appears here as the preparer. And how did he prepare? How did he say and how did he prepare the people then for the coming of the Messiah? He called them to repent. Remember I told you yesterday, repent means to change your mind, switch from trusting in yourself or any of your own merits, and instead trust in God's mercy and the person of Christ who died for your sins. That's the way to prepare for the coming kingdom. And that was the first thing John the Baptist said. The first thing he said we needed to do. We needed to be prepared, which is why John preached 
repentance. And then the second thing he did was he practiced baptism. John himself did this. The people from all over the region, Jerusalem, Judea, and all around, they went to him and he baptized them in the Jordan as they confessed their sins. In other words, this passage is simply telling us that people came out to him and acknowledged, responded to his preaching and said, yes, John, you're right, I am a sinner. I need to be prepared for this coming kingdom. And John said, okay, repent, and then he baptized them. Now, the Greek word baptizo, as used here in the ancient world, was a word used of the dipping of cloth and the changing of the colour of a cloth, either by bleaching or dyeing it. And the way it's been used here, of course, is what is called in grammar a metaphorical meaning or a figurative meaning. So baptism, on a literal sense, simply means to immerse or dip. But in its metaphorical meaning being used here by Matthew, it's talking about cleansing and identification. So this baptism here was being used as a symbol, as a representation of the fact they have made a decision, repented and been cleansed of their sins by repenting and having faith in Jesus Christ. And that's why John baptism here and elsewhere in the New Testament is referred to sometimes as the baptism of repentance. Because you have repented, the external representation of what you have done internally could be demonstrated by this physical act of baptism. Later, when we get to the end of this book, right at the end in chapter 28, it will tell us that Jesus commissions us as believers, to go into all the world. And he says, I want you to make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's what we today call believer's baptism. But here, friends, is my main point. This passage tells us the kingdom is coming and we need to be prepared. So how do you prepare? Number one, you repent. You change your mind about trusting yourself and switch it to trusting in Christ. Number two, you get baptised. That was the pattern of John's preaching. And I believe still today all believers need to willingly go through believers' baptism. And then we should go tell others about what has happened to us, what God has done for you, and offer that good news to others. Now, some people get the mistaken idea that it is the baptism itself that washes away the sin. But that is wrong. Baptism, as I've explained it here, is a symbol. It's a figurative representation of what God has done in your life. Believer's baptism is a picture of the fact that we too have died and been buried with Christ. And as we're raised up out of the water, it's a symbol of resurrection and the cleansing of our sin. We too, like Christ, are raised up. But in our case, we're raised up to a new life. The old is gone, the new begins, and it's a new life with him, a resurrected spiritual life. And that is what believer's baptism illustrates. So you're not going to find Jesus in the pool or in the baptismal font. He's not in the water. I once heard of a rather amusing story of a pastor baptising people in the river of the town that he lived. And a drunk came along the river bank and stumbled into the water and then stood up right beside the pastor. The pastor, somewhat shocked, said, Are you here to be baptised today? And the drunk, who was probably also a bit shocked, said, What do I need to do? And the minister said, Well, first, I need to ask you if you find Jesus Christ. And the drunk said, Well, maybe. Did he fall in here as well? Now, that's just an amusing story, but my point I'm trying to make is a serious one. If you're trying to find Jesus by looking at the ceremony of baptism, it's not the place to look. Jesus is not in the water. It's not been transformed and given any magical properties. He's not there. We all need to be baptized if we've trusted in Jesus Christ for no other reason than he commanded it. And when we do it, it's a testimony, a representation, a symbol of what he has previously done in our lives. And we're just marking that with a physical event that represents it. I often think that my favorite way to illustrate this when talking to people is to take 
the wedding ring off my hand and say to people, does this wedding ring make me married? Now, I'm sure it makes my wife happy as long as I can, when I continue to wear it, but I don't put this on to be married and take it off to no longer be married. It's not something I can click in and out of. It stands as a ring on my finger, an unbroken circle, which represents, of course, a covenant relationship, which a marriage is. It's a symbol that I am married. Does going in the water of baptism, is that itself what makes you a Christian? No more than going into McDonald's makes you a hamburger. Baptism is a symbol, a representation of the fact that you have reached a point in your life that you have trusted to Christ and you're signaling that to others. So, the king is coming. The kingdom is coming. And in order to prepare, we need to trust in Christ. And then, if you've done that already, you should be baptised as a testimony to what has actually happened in your life. But there's something else in this passage, a rather fascinating point as we get towards the end. It's a point at which John the Baptist proclaims the fact that the judgment is coming. He sees these Pharisees and Sadducees coming and he calls them snakes. And he asks, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now the background to this is clearly John's popularity was spreading to such an extent that the religious leaders from Jerusalem had left the city and they'd come out to the wilderness to see what's going on. Who is this new preacher that's attracting such a crowd, they thought. And he sees them coming and he says to them, he actually points to them, it says in one of the other accounts, and he says, wrath is coming, who told you to flee? This is a powerful rebuke. And then he says, therefore, go bear fruit worthy of repentance. Now, they were just like the people. They had been taught and they were trusting in the fact that they were descendants of Abraham and they were trusting in their religious position. What I want you to notice is he told them also to change their mind from depending on those things rather to depending on God's mercy. But also note, notice he dovetails the end of that by saying, but first bear fruit that's worthy of repentance. You see, God wants us to change our mind from trusting ourselves and trusting in Jesus Christ himself. But then he wants us, he wants you, he wants me, he wanted them. He wants to see the fruit of what comes after that. He wants to see us repent and be baptised, but then what is called to bear fruit. Let me just read the last two verses of this Matthew 3, of the section we're looking at at the moment, verses 11 and 12. John, in sort of summarising and concluding what he's saying and what he's got going on here on that day in this place, he says this, I baptise you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquestionable fire. The close of this passage is saying, you need to do something about this. And you need to do something about this because judgment is coming. He says, if God just wanted what he calls children of Abraham, if God just wanted religious people, then in this case, the generation of people who just followed the traditions of their forefathers, he actually says he could have taken stones and done that. So he's saying, don't trust the fact that you're a child of someone religious or you're part of a religious community or a religious nation or that you or someone in your family held a religious position because you are in danger of just ending up being the son of a viper, a snake. Now that's a heavy statement, which is why he warns that the axe is laid to the fruit of the tree. It's a last minute thing. It's about to be swung and every tree that does not bear fruit is going to be cut down, he said, and thrown into the fire of judgment. So what do they need to do? What do we need to do? What do you need to do? Well, we need to be prepared and we are prepared by repenting and being baptised and that prepares us to meet the Messiah. 
Now clearly there's a connection here with fire and it's a little bit of debate about how to interpret the last phrase about being baptised with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Many experts believe this refers to Jesus baptising with the Holy Spirit in his first coming and he baptises with fire in his second coming. And that fits the context and it is the much supported wise interpretation that most Christians have taken over the centuries. But what's this stuff about a winnowing fork in his hand and how he will come through and cleanse the threshing floor? So you see, it's all packed in here. He's making three points all at once. Three metaphorical points, in fact. His winnowing fork in his hands. He's going to cleanse out the threshing floor and gather the wheat into the barn. And he will burn up the chaff within question and fill fire. So there's three illustrations here, all packed into a couple of verses. And they're all in some way connected with fire. The first is a lumberjack cutting down the forest and throwing the unfruitful trees into the fire. The second is the fact that at some point Jesus is going to baptise with fire. And then the third is this idea of the winnowing of wheat. Now that is a rather foreign idea to most people today living in an industrial society. But the idea is an important one and it's this. At that time they gathered the wheat and they put it in a pile. And then they took a pitchfork and they scooped up that wheat and they tossed it in the air repeatedly. And this is called winnowing. Because by doing that, they would separate the wheat from what's called the chaff. They would often do it on a blustery day and the wind would blow as they did it. And as they would toss it in the air, it would blow the lighter chaff away. And the wheat would fall to the ground and that is how the wheat would be separated from the chaff. The chaff was inedible and its only purpose was as kindling for the fire. And Jesus here is using this as an illustration of the preparation of people for the judgment. God himself is going to separate the wheat from the chaff. Later in the Gospels it will say how he will separate the sheep from the goats as well. So there's a number of pictures here referring to this. And what it is referring to is the judgment. And this passage we've been looking at these last cusping of days by really warning us that judgment is coming. So we need to do something about this. So in conclusion, what's coming? The kingdom is coming and judgment is coming. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to be prepared for those eventualities. And the answer is to repent, to change our mind about what and who we're trusting in, to get baptised as a testimony to what God has done in our lives, and then go and bear fruit. So what should that fruit look like? What does it mean to bear fruit? Well, look in his account of this exactly the same situation. He gives us a little more than the main sermon. Matthew just does the main text, but Luke includes a few answers to some questions that the crowd asked after he said this message. I'll just read it for you. So this is the crowd speaking, and he says, What should we do then? The crowd asked. Anyone who has two shirts, share one with someone who has none. Anyone who has food, should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptised. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then soldiers asked them, what should we do? And he replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely and be content with your pay. Be content with what you have. These people, are having heard this teaching, are coming and saying, what should we do? We've done this. We've gone to John. We've done this. What should we expect to see as the fruit of what's happened in their lives? And he's defining the fruit and what it should produce. The fruit that is worthy of repentance means being generous. He even tells the tax collectors who came to be baptised, and they ask, what should we do? His reply is simply to be honest and to collect no more than is appointed to. So be loving, fair and honest with people. And likewise, the soldiers asked, and these are people who have positions of tremendous power, and they're saying, how should we live our lives now? And he doesn't say stop being soldiers. He just says, do not intimidate anybody and don't overuse your power and never falsely accuse anybody. And the bottom line is be content with what you have. This is the kind of fruit that John the Baptist is mentioning here. And it's about trusting God, being content with what you have, and not mistreating other people, and particularly not mistreating other people. Your position in society gives you some sort of power 
or ability to do that by abusing it. Okay, let me sum up everything I've said today. You ready? What's coming? The kingdom is coming and judgment is coming. They're both coming. Two things are coming according to this passage. And because of that, we need to be prepared. And how do we prepare? Well, you repent, you get baptized, and then you go and bear fruit. So the question at the end of this passage that we've been looking at yesterday and today, and what I'm closing by asking is the same one I asked at the beginning. And the question is, are you prepared? If the king is really coming, if the kingdom is really coming, if judgment is really coming, then are you prepared? Suppose I was to tell you that Jesus is definitely coming back in your lifetime. Well, he is. What are you saying, you might think, no, when Jesus returns? No, but as far as we are concerned, living in this temporal life, Jesus is coming in our lifetimes because either he will return and break through into this life or we shall live out our natural days and die and then immediately we too will face him. So Jesus is coming in our lifetime. Are you prepared? Some are enjoying the journey, but they're not really preparing for the destination. They're not ready to land. In April of 1988, there was a piece written in the London Evening News about a skydiver who was also a photographer. He and some of his friends jumped out of a plane and he went first. And there they were free falling and he was taking pictures with his cameras, catching great images of everyone as they followed him out of the plane one by one. At the last minute he reached out for his ripcord and realised he hadn't even put his parachute on. They recovered the film and they got some great shots. And he completed his journey but he wasn't prepared for his landing. He wasn't prepared for his inevitable destination. In his case, he wasn't prepared because he hadn't put on his parachute and in fact, he plunged to his death. I have one final piece of advice for you before we close off this section. Don't take another step. Don't jump unless you are prepared for what will definitely be your final destination. <laughs>